All right. Um, I'd like to also thank all of you who are members and donors because we couldn't really do what we do without your support. Um, we, uh, we continue to surprise elected officials when we talk about what we do. We're poised to spend over one and a half million dollars in those parks in making a difference. Um, unfortunately, the city has never been able to um, have the resources to really create world-class parks. And that's what those parks should be and, and, and need to be raised to. Um, and we partner with the city in making a difference and making that happen. So thank you, and I hope that whenever you're there, you have a moment of pride that uh, you, you are making a difference um, in there. Um, we are also, as we said, you know, we have this private-public partnership, which is something to really be quite proud of with the city and with parks. Um, and if anyone happened to be at the hearing yesterday, hearing the amazing remarks of our commissioner, Chris Cook, was inspiring for us. That is a relationship that um, I know the Friends have spent a tremendous amount of time developing. And to hear Chris sort of speak um, to our hard work, really, it, 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 was a nice, it was a nice opportunity to feel good about our hard work. But we've been doing that on nothing more than really a, a bit of what I call the pinky shake. So we've been working very hard with the city on creating a formal plan, um, an agreement about the work that we do and the work that Parks does. Um, we're close, we wish it were done, but we're not quite there yet. And I do hope it's something that I'll be able to announce at one of our meetings uh, in the not too distant future. The other thing that's coming up on her horizon that we're very excited about is we'll be turning 50 uh, in 2020, which seems like a ways away. Um, but when we start to talk about what we'd, li we'd like to do for our 50th, um, we're really worried we're running out of time. So stay tuned and you'll hear more about um, what we have in mind for our 50th. Um, one of the things I was hoping to um, have a chance to talk to you tonight was about um, Linda Cox, who is a longtime member and active uh, person within the Friends, many of you may know. Linda has agreed to take on our Legacy Society, and some of you may be Legacy Society members. There are people who have made uh, bequeaths and gifts to us in wills or other structured giving. Um, and we're looking forward to partnering with Linda oops, and sharing a little bit more information about that type of advocacy and donate, donating for us. Um, but anyway, Linda couldn't be with us tonight, but we will have some brochures outside. Um, it's just another way uh, that helps us fund all the work that we do. But you don't want to hear from me, so, but thank you again. Um, and I'd like to turn it over for a moment to our executive director, Lise Visa. Thank you, Leslie. Welcome to all of you, and I will share Leslie's thanks and say thank you again. We really could not do our work without you. So I want to give you a, a little snapshot of what we did do with your wonderful support this last year. As Leslie said, we are on, on course to uh, spend about $1.8 million in parks, care, and public programs in this year. And next year, we are budgeted to do over $2 million. So it's, it's, it gives you a sense of how important the work is and how much it costs to do. And as Leslie said, we are essential partners. The city has never been able to do it alone, and cities don't do it alone. Public-private partners partnerships are critical in every urban park in the country. But what did we do? A couple of things. Um, a lot of our money, probably about a half a million dollars, between a quarter of a half a million dollars, goes into the living systems, the trees, the turf, the soils. It, it costs a lot of money to keep a, a, an elm tree alive and, and fight against Dutch elm disease, so a terrific amount of money goes to that. With the support of the Joan and Henry Lee Sculpture Endowment, which many of you made possible, we did sculpture conservation work. In the common, we conserved the Soldiers and Sailors Monument on the Flagstaff Hill and the Founders Memorial. A couple of things we did in the garden were the George Washington statue and the Japanese lantern. And in the Mall, we did the Women's Memorial. And that wonderful memorial turned 15 this year. We had a wonderful, they had a wonderful celebration of the uh, Women's Commission there. We also partner with the Linda Hand Society, which was an, is a char charitable organization founded by Edward Everett Hale. And we celebrated our restoration of the terrace of that statue. It's 
I see Stephen Jonas. <laughs> and thanks to Stephen and, and Cheryl, we were able to do that work. Just said it, it's the monument that you see when you cross the mid-block crossing of the uh, Common uh, Charles Street from the Common to the Garden. And Stephen visits this sculpture every day. And if we have a bad winter, he's going to be very frustrated because the Parks Department may not plow to get to that sculpture. But it just shows you how important each of these monuments are to each of you. So we had a, a, a celebration to celebrate our restoration of that terrace and the 125th anniversary of that organization. We also enjoyed our seventh season on Brewer Plaza with a celebration of the 150th anniversary of that, of that um, fountain. It's the first piece of public art that landed on Boston Common. And it was a wonderful celebration. We invited the fifth grade from a Quincy School in Chinatown to write poems um, celebrating the, the uh, fountain. And they read, some of them read those poems that day. It was a really wonderful day. Uh, it inspired us to do an annual event every year to celebrate the launching of, of Brewer Plaza. So watch for that next year. I want to recognize all of you who volunteer. Now, one thing we don't have in our parks is a lot of invasive species to pull and weeds. I mean, if you go down to the river, you can do that for, for years. If you go into the woodlands of some of our parks in the city, you can do that. But we do have some things that are important to do. And I want to recognize the Rose Brigade, which celebrated their 31st year in the roses and had a celebration of their annual party this week. The Border Brigade, which is now in their third year. And the Untold Stories of the Public Garden, our docent program. Is anybody a member of one of those initiatives here? If you would raise your hand. Thank you so much for your volunteer support. Our major uh, project this year is restoration of the Shaw 54th Memorial. That's the first project we did in 1981, raising what sounded like a lot of money then, $200,000. So fast forward to this year, we have, uh, we are, amassing, <laughs> let's call it, $2.8 million, half of which is coming from the National Park Service. We're putting in $750,000 thanks to the, the uh, Pierce Charitable Trust and the city's putting the rest of it in. We need to take that entire monument off from the, from the plaza level up and rebuild the core of below it, the foundation below the monument. When our monument conservator, the stone conservator, was doing work three years ago, he pulled a stone aside and saw a, a deteriorating brick foundation, which means that that monument could not withstand a seismic event. So what that meant was that we are not only just doing this work, working with the National Park Service in the city, but we are partnering with the Museum of African American um, History to use this as a platform for dialogue, to talk about race um, and difference um, and justice. And the, um, we have a particularly fraught time to be talking about it and, and an opportune time to talk about it. So we are close to pr uh, promoting this event in January, but put in your books January 9th. We'll be having a forum and we're bringing the voices of an activist, an artist, and a historian to talk about the power of public monuments and why they matter. Lastly, we're working with the Parks Department over the next year to develop a master plan for Boston Common. As you know, money is coming from the Winthrop Square development for the Common. And what we said to the city is we don't want that money just thrown at this park. In fact, that money could disappear in this park very easily because it needs many millions of dollars. But what we said, we needed to have a process to develop a collective vision for the future of that park that all of us take part in. So watch out for, I'm involved, we are involved through me in the selection process of the team. Um, we hope we'll get a really great team to start working by the end of the year or early next year on this vision of the future of this park. For all you young friends and young at heart, I just want to let you know that on December 7th, we have a Young Friends Winter Social at the Union Club from 5.30 to 9, so please come. Also, Leslie mentioned the Legacy Society. Another thing I'd love to encourage you, we'd love to encourage you to do, is to become a sustaining member with a monthly donation. It helps us do the work in the parks and it makes it very easy for you to contribute, so please consider that. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Marie Law Adams and Dan Adams. Marie and Dan are founders of Landing Studio, an architecture and urban design practice. Their work is focused on the design of industrial and infrastructural systems in cities through vehicles such as shared use landscapes, buildings, festivals, and light installations. And you'll understand more about this when you hear from Marie and Dan. 
Dan is the director of the School of Architecture at Northeastern University, and Marie is a lecturer in urban design at MIT. Marie and Dan will be presenting the vision they have developed for Charles Gate with the Charles Gate Alliance, and I want to recognize Randall Albright. Thank you for being here. Randall's one of the the leaders of that effort, it's now almost two years that you started the Charles Gate Alliance. So they are one of our new uh, green space partners. It's wonderful that you did um, grab that neighborhood and say we need to revitalize the Charles Gate neighborhood and knit together three historic parks, Commonwealth Avenue Mall, the Fens as part of the Emerald Necklace, and the Esplanade. And our um, Commonwealth Avenue Mall Committee Chair, Margaret Picorni, has been very involved in this process. So we are excited to hear these ideas, and now I'll turn it over to Marie and Dan. So we want to, um, we're very happy to be here tonight to share this work. Um, and first, we just want to thank Liz and Susan and Leslie for inviting us. Um, we're happy to be here with the Friends of the Public Garden. Uh, Charles Gate Alliance, who um, has really initiated this work that we'll be sharing tonight. The Emerald Necklace Conservancy has also provided a lot of guidance and support on this project, and the Solomon Foundation has provided the initial funding, um, matching grants to, st to hire us and begin the planning process for Charles Gate Park. And then the DCR and the DOT, and we'll talk a little bit more about how this is really a place where a lot of things in Boston come together, including the DCR and the DOT. Um, <laughs> So um, we're going to break this into three parts, but it's a very uh, quick presentation. Uh, first, we're going to introduce the Charles Gate area and talk about why it's really such an important and special place in Boston. Second, we're going to talk about infrastructural landscapes, um, which was really something that we see was part of Olmsted's vision for Boston and how that can be sort of um, updated today at Charles Gate through some other project ideas. And then the plans for the future at Charles Gate and the, the kind of vision that we've been working on with the Charles Gate community and the public agency and, and, um, and local elected officials. Um, so anyway, I'll start with where is Charles Gate. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, it's the area that's, uh, that's outlined there in pink. And as Liz was, was saying, this is in such an important place in Boston because it's where the Comhav Mall comes together with the Fens and the Esplanade. Charles Gate was originally designed as the piece of the emerald necklace that met to the Charles River and connected back to the Fens and, and really was an important hydrological aspect in the park system and a very important mobility part of the system in terms of, of making these connections between the, the um, Commonwealth Avenue Mall and the Fens. So a big initiative of this project is to knit those things back together and so we'll show here again that the, the really important place of charles gate park is is right there it's it's where the muddy river meets the charles river and in terms of water quality issues urban flooding and stormwater management it's it's the place where everything really happens um, we'll show a little bit more of that in a minute and then we think this is this is a you know an interesting drawing where it really does show this this park is the kind of keystone of those open space systems in the city, um, which have been over the time pulled uh, uh, fragmented from each other. When Charles Gate was first designed by Olmsted, the neighborhood was one of the most desirable neighborhoods in Boston. These are some of the slide or some of the um, uh, historic park postcards from one of the founders of Charles Gate Alliance, Parker James, but you can just see it was a, a really kind of picturesque neighborhood. You can see on the upper right here that the Muddy, Muddy River was actually something like a pond here as it connected to the Charles River. And anyone who has been to Charles Gate recently uh, knows that that's not at all what it looks like today. Um, <laughs> And it's really, uh, a lot of it is due to this, the, the construction of the Boker Overpass. Um, so in the 1950s, Sturrow Drive was, was created, which cut the Muddy River off from the Charles River. And then in the late 1960s, the Boker Overpass was built. And you can see the kind of march of the pylons right through the center of the parkland. The Muddy River itself became highly constricted when the overpass was built. It was no longer a series of ponds that managed the stormwater and, and created this really beautiful open space in the city. And it became something that really separated the neighborhoods of Charles Gate and, and made it a, a sort of no man's land. 
Um, however, something that is is maybe not well as well known or is even surprising to some of the people who go to Charles Gate every day because not much of this is left anymore. Even when the Boker overpass was first built, Charles Gate was designed as a park. Um, there was a plan uh, with Maurice Gary, landscape architects, Ben Gary is still in practice today, um, to, to create this, this planted space underneath the overpass. And so Dan and I always talk about how there's a lot of, of highway underpass projects happening today. It's not a new idea. This, this actually happened back in the 1960s to kind of try to, to, to create a space for people underneath the overpass. But there were some problems with the design and over time, and I'll just kind of show some details of it, there was Pakistandra, Pakistandra that was planted underneath the entire overpass, regardless of whether it was under the shadow of it. Every, everywhere along in the whole landscape was Pakistandra. Um, but since then, the park has been kind of bit by bit taken away. There were um, lighting features, <coughs> benches, all of the plantings over the years have been removed from the park. So this is just some evidence of the, the kind of disrepair and neglect that you can find around Charles Gate today. A lot of graffiti, broken sidewalks, and that sort of thing. And then the whole environment is very kind of desolate and uninviting. And a lot of the reason, we'll kind of argue, is there was a lack of, of kind of integration between what was happening above and what's happening below. So anytime any kind of maintenance had to happen on the, on the overpass above, the machines were brought in, destroyed the landscape, the plantings were taken out, and it was never really revitalized as a park space. And so we want to start to look at this as a place that's sort of designed in concert with the infrastructure system above and to see how we can make those two things more um, uh, synergistic in their relationship. This is a, a really complicated site. So this, this map here is from um, a, a, a dredging project of the Muddy River in 2002. Um, What's very interesting about it is it starts to show all the different jurisdictions that come together at Charles Gate. So Mass DOT um, maintains the infrastructure above, and then DCR has jurisdiction over the, the landscape below, which results in, in some of these kind of um, disjunctions where you have the overpass and all the stormwater runoff from the overpass <coughs> discharging directly into the muddy river here, which creates a lot of uh, water quality issues with all of the um, heavy metals, sediments, and so on coming from the roadway right into this water course. Um, the Muddy River itself was really never a fast-moving river. It was a tidal marsh. And so this area is actually just very, very flat. It was a, a you know, a marshland. And so there's not very much of a gradient between upriver and the Charles. And so the water is very slow and stagnant, which kind of exacerbates the issues with um, stormwater quality with all of that coming from the highway above. So this is what we see almost you know, all of the time at, at Charles Gate. Um, lots of evidence of water quality problems, which is a, a really big concern of the local community for very good reason. Uh, duckweed blooms always happening over after rain events because of all of the, the nitrogen and phosphates um, coming into the water. You can see these outfalls from the, the streets, um, sewer system uh, surrounding, and then the um, untreated water from the Boker overpass above. You can also note the nature of the, the riverbank here. It's, it's paved, actually. Um, so there's a lot of issues paved, and in some areas it's very heavily compacted dirt. So everything that, that you know, any drop of water that, that hits the ground here goes immediately in. There's not very much treatment. There's no space for habitat. It's, it's not a great environment um, for, for animals. And uh, so this is something where we see there's a lot of room for improvement at Charles Gate. There's also a lot of really interesting, great things at Charles Gate. How many times in the city do you get this kind of conflation of all these historic um, relics of architecture with these Olmsted granite um, uh, balustrades here right next to the, the kind of Shercliffe era um, concrete guardrail? And then actually what we think is, is really interesting, Shepley, Bullfinch, Richardson, and Abbott was hired to design the overpass above. So it's not, it was an overpass that was designed to be um, sort of modernist, very simple structure. There was a lot of thought that went into it. Um, it, it, you know, ended up bringing a lot of problems to the area, but there are these interesting moments where different eras of thinking kind of um, come, come together on the site. Yeah. 
And then things like this here, um, this was the Fens Pond Bridge that used to be the, the historic water line with the Charles River. This is almost impossible to get to. You have to kind of crawl around some of the bridge structures. And it's this amazing, this is the view from it, this amazing kind of terminus of the Muddy River as it that enters into a series of culverts and goes out to the Charles. These are the kinds of places we want to bring back into the Charles Gate community and open up for enjoyment. Um, and it shouldn't have to take, you know, some special urban explorers to get over to this kind of space in the city. And then this too, if you frame the views the right way, um, there's some really beautiful spaces still in Charles Gate but there's a lot of work to be done as well. And so a lot of that is happening now because the, the neighborhood's becoming organized and there's a lot of partnerships that have been made. So um, the Charles Gate Alliance has started to work with the Emerald Necklace Conservancy and all of these groups, including their Friends of the Public Garden, has been supportive um, as, a, as another partner, agent, partner group. And um, so this Charles Gate Alliance was established two years ago. They've been doing a lot of really good work, and what we've been doing over the last year is coming up with a plan for the future, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is a completely community-led process. We've done um, five public meetings now. This was some images of the first four, where we're trying to establish what are the priorities for Charles Gate Park. And those really come around the idea of improving the quality of the water at the Muddy River, reconnecting the park system, so bringing better mobility to the area, celebrating these really interesting historic moments that all kind of happen here at Charles Gate, and then bringing activity to the site. You can see it's a very uninviting and sort of neglected space right now. Um, there's a very enthusiastic community of dog park dog owners, and so a dog park is something that we can really see um, enlivening the space, and there's a lot of other opportunities there. So Dan's going to talk about some ideas. Um, yeah, so we'll just uh, jump to a different site to just um, talk about a couple things because I think one of the most um, remarkable things about the Emerald Necklace, and I'll say, so I was mentioned, like I'm the director of the School of Architecture at Northeastern, and I can testify that literally every single student of landscape architecture, urban design, and architecture in the country and in many parts of the world study the Emerald Necklace as a model of landscape. It's in every textbook. <laughs> we certainly bring all of our students there. The reason for that is because Olmsted pioneered this concept of green infrastructure before green infrastructure was even a recognized phenomenon in the city. So he didn't, he wasn't just looking at landscapes in maybe the conventional sense of, oh, they're beautiful and they're great for recreation, but that they, they, uh, they provide um, sort of incalculable value to the urban environment. It's about health, it's about social well-being, it's about habitat corridors, it's about managing water, it's about helping people breathe. They have just such a fundamental infrastructural value. And that, that was his idea in the 1880s, which is ironic because it's in many ways what we're trying to rediscover today. Sort of after all these, to be honest, kind of mistakes and things we're trying to learn. And in many ways, what happened after that period is this kind of radical divorce between landscape systems and infrastructure systems, where in fact the city almost becomes like a designed abuse of this environment, as opposed to being designed in concert with this environment. And so this is an example of one of those maybe abuses, I would say. So it's always sort of amazing because uh, like everything in this photograph was the Atlantic Ocean, for example. This is a photograph of the Atlantic Ocean 200 years ago. And obviously, a lot of things have changed. So this is between the South End and South Boston. And it's not at all dissimilar from what we're uh, facing at Charles Gate. So at the north is the I-93 corridor, and down south is all the uh, train tracks going into uh, South Station. And in the middle is Four Point Channel. And I think what's often forgotten is that these things are inherently married. We, we think of them as so like separate from each other, but it's one system. And in many ways, what unifies them is, is the water. So this was a project we undertook from which I think we learned a lot of lessons that we're now trying to apply to Charles Gate. So this is the landscape under I-93. And sort of different than Charles Gate, what was amazing about this landscape is there were no people. It was designed intentionally to try and keep people out because people were perceived as like a problem. Um, <laughs> uh, it would just lead to crime and violence and negative things. And in fact, as, as, you, as anyone would predict, by keeping people out, exactly what it led to was crime and violence and problems. Um, so the philosophy was changed. It said, how can you get people in? Um, 
and what kind of landscape would it be that would bring people into this environment? And then how could you use the, you know, in a strange way, the blessing of the viaduct is that it leaves a landscape beneath it. And so the question becomes, well, what can you do with this landscape? Is there more that can be done? And so that became the charge. And so what we became really interested in this project was about how that water system is really what unifies all of these systems, which again, wasn't our idea. That's just Olmsted's idea. Um, and so here you see these kind of ubiquitous drain leaders. Uh, Marie has already shown them at Charles Gate. And what those are tying together is a complex engineered system of watersheds of the highway above, which every like rain event captures millions and millions of gallons of water. And of course, we contaminate that water with the millions and millions of cars that we drive and all the times we press our brakes and we have leaky petroleum, <coughs> hydraulic fluid. And we translate that all into really complex underground networks of pipes that move that water and then ultimately, in this case, dump it in the Atlantic Ocean. And of course, what we're all realizing today is that that's like a bad thing to do as the ocean is dying. Um, and it, you know, it, uh, so we should probably do something about that and um, figure that out. And again, the weird blessing of the viaduct is the landscape and that it actually provides the potentials of the landscape to do something about it. And so the question became, could we start to sort of cut that system and insert a little bit of Olmsted uh, under the highway? So in this case, you can see we're severing those drain leaders. We're rerouting the water. You gotta imagine after a major rain event, that water comes down like a fire hose. Um, so we have to actually slow the water down. We try and filter it initially through these um, catch basins. And then we just release it. We put it back into the landscape because those same nitrogens and Phosphorus that's damaging the ocean is actually fertilizer for plants and the plants can take those nutrients and they can grow and they can give us back oxygen and they can evapotranspirate the water into the atmosphere. So all that water, so for example, this project now takes all that highway ramps water and in classic Olmsted sense, instead of putting it in the ocean, it feeds it to plants. Uh, so none of that water anymore goes to Four Point Channel. And we capture all those different wastes and solid, the things that are damaging the waterways, damaging Four Point Channel, damaging our harbor, and ultimately damaging our ocean. And we capture that so it can be cleaned up and responsibly disposed of, not just sort of disseminated blindly into the ocean. And to do that is a little complex. Of course, this is a sort of a complex ecosystem, right, of shadows and water. And where is it that you could support plant life? And everyone said you can't support plant life as they were standing on weeds. <laughs> Probably can somehow. Um, and it became you know, a complex ex exercise of sort of mapping uh, sunlight locations and how you can even see the little bands of light, um, how those actually allow for the creation of plants, which allow for the creation of oxygen and allow for evapotranspiration. And then how you can create sort of pedestrian landscapes and new multimodal paths that bring people through, how that can become a framework for the installation of artwork. And I think Marie mentioned this before, that one of the, I think, the fundamental problems we came to find with Charles Gate is that we had sort of maybe forgotten the philosophies of Olmsted and that instead of thinking about how a landscape could be designed in concert with infrastructure, they had really become very divorced from each other. And so what we aimed to do here was think about how that landscape could be very responsive to the infrastructure and the, the needs of, let's say, the DOT, which are very legitimate and real needs. They have to inspect the entire highway for cracks. Every square inch of the highway has to be inspected for cracks. It's something we came to discover killed all that Pacassandra, for example, was that they had to bring their manlifts out and drive it all over the Pacassandra to inspect the highway. Above. So the Pacassandra died, not surprising. <laughs> So this became a whole system of, okay, we're going to study their man lifts and how they move and how far they can reach. And if we put paved environments that let the water flow around them, those paved environments now allow the man lifts to get up and inspect the overhead highway, but they also allow for things like basketball so that, you know, the same plate that's allowing man lifts can allow recreation in the wetland or all sorts of other recreational uses. So again, it's a radically different landscape, but the question here becomes how do we start to translate those ideas now into this, uh, in a way, very remarkable site, because while at 
I-93, it was about creating an environment that no one had ever been in, had never been conceived of park. It's like, how do we sort of recreate the park given this new infrastructural paradigm? And so in order to, to kind of wrap our heads around this and, and, and think through what needs to happen, we saw the design process as something that's, that's um, about thinking through what are the, all the layers of things that are happening at Charles Gate. So this um, is a diagram showing all of the different conditions along the water's edge. So some of them are paved with granite, some of it is heavy camp compacted dirt, and others are uh, more kind of concrete paved areas. <coughs> so eventually the idea is to, to start to take some of that away and re-naturalize the shoreline. The other is to look at that whole sewer infrastructure and how the roadways are feeding into the muddy river, how the highway or the overpass above is feeding into the muddy river, and where can we intervene in that system and bring all of that stormwater into the planted landscape area. And then the, the really important layer is where are all the historic plants, trees, bridges, architectural relics. They're all over Charles Gate, and those start to give us a little bit of a game board in terms of places we don't really want to touch anything at all. We just want to bring people to it and, and create the possibility to appreciate and enjoy the beauty, the little moments of beauty that actually are still there. So we want to kind of, this is that Olmstead Bridge that's right near the, the kind of um, end of Charles, or the end of the Muddy River at the Charles and by bringing in some new kind of small, tactical little bridge structures, we can make this a place that's accessible by people. And really, this rendering isn't showing very much at all because this is really what it looks like in the springtime. It's just a little bridge here that makes it possible for people to get there. And it's no longer a place that's out of sight and out of mind. So just like at the I-93 site, I mean, I think what Marie was showing a minute ago are really what I would call like designs where you conceive of water as the enemy, right? It's like water comes in the city and how fast can you get it out of the city? Here it's about how can we actually design these systems in concert? So as opposed to a landscape that's about just flushing the water out as fast as possible, how do we actually reinsert these sort of dynamic environments that that water can be fed to plants and those plants can in, in turn give us a park and the health of the landscape. <coughs> These, for example, are our efforts. So this is just our initial regrading plan. Essentially, in the history of this site, as Marie showed before, it was a system of lakes that were then infilled. What we're trying to do now is start actually reinserting wetland constructs for sort of interstitial habitat and water management. This is the system of how we would start to grab that water from the city streets and from the highway and where it would actually discharge into that landscape. And then as was described, I mean, it, I think it can't be emphasized enough that in the history of this site, you could be in Watertown and ride a horse to Roxbury through a contiguous park system, which was a kind of an amazing concept. Um, it's really the first of its kind green network in the city. And so the idea that when they built this connective infrastructure of the highway it broke all of those landscape connections. How do we start to re-stitch it together with multimodal networks for pedestrians and cyclists? And then where is it that the DOT is going to have to get up in their man lifts and inspect again every square inch of the highway and what are we going to do to accommodate that so that as we build all these connections we don't then uh, destroy them simply because of what we have to do to preserve the infrastructure. And then once, so I guess what we're trying to describe here is this whole layered process of thinking about water management, connectivity, manless, and in the end how that starts to create sort of a, a game board or a, a sort of a palette of opportunities for recreation, which can, when you put these together, you fundamentally have a new park of infrastructure and management, recreation, and habitat. And I think it's important, a lot of times people sort of uh, is overlook, we always say, like, wow, imagine if you could just create a 13-acre park in the middle of the city. Where else are you going to just find 13 acres? And it's been so fragmented and chopped up that I don't think it's sort of conceived of this, the city as this actually sort of massive and latent park uh, sort of lost in the heart of the city. So here again is another view of that idea where you can see the sort of armoring of the shoreline, again, where water is the enemy, get it out. You can see that in the 1960s, they built these decorative um, granite walls, which while they're beautiful walls, also have the effect of really fragmenting and breaking apart the landscape. So you can't kind of see what's going on behind. 
So the idea is to actually sort of remove that armory, create interstitial environments between the water and the land, open those views. <coughs> this is a little bit of that infrastructural design about how we can grab that water, <coughs> reroute it from the ocean into plants to sort of fertilize the habitat space and ecosystem of the city. I think one of the interesting things for us is we're often in our work dealing with highly infrastructural environments. It, it, this is certainly the first time that we've confronted such an infrastructural environment on top of an Olmsted uh, <laughs> landscape. That's a, uh, I couldn't think of another such environment in the world, in fact. And so what we've been looking at is surveying all the other parks of the Emerald Necklace to think about how these kind of new traditions of infrastructural management could be incorporated with the old. So how maybe sort of designs we've invented at places like I-93 could be translated to like the Olmsteadian grottos of things like Franklin Park. So that you're seeing here, for example, this person sitting on the idea of one of those grottos as the water is moving into an interstitial landscape that allows for the filtration, allows for the evaporation and the evapotranspiration. Yeah, I think like that bridge on the corner there is actually the Newbury Street terminates right at this site and how could Newbury Street be connected into the Charles Gate? And how with slight manipulations of that landscape could we start to encourage new forms of habitat like we've brought onto our team a river restoration ecology firm that's all about how do you literally design a river to accommodate what species. So for example, we know that this river has migrating herring that come from the Charles River. It's like the really daring herring that make their way up. <laughs> so like maybe there's like five herring today. There should be literally a million herring a year migrating up the river. So we've been working with <coughs> geofluvial morphologists and river restoration ecologists. We've working with an underwater photographer who's documenting herring runs in Plymouth to say this is what we should have here. Like this is the environment we should have. We have migrating. We actually have uh, turtle egg laying habitat all along the river. So this is that armored shoreline, and this—I mean, I think this image is one we always really like because it really sort of sums up that ambition. I mean, in the end, this is actually what infrastructure should look like. This is what, in the era of Olmsted, infrastructure looked like. This is, uh, we always, we, I sort of joke, like, this is what a pipe can look like. <laughs> um, this is actually a pipe. I mean, I will say every single drop of water that falls in, that is, uh, falls in Brookline or falls in the Back Bay goes to the Muddy uh, River. That's the, the genesis of the Muddy River is the city. So this is a piece of infrastructure. It served us. Um, it doesn't have to be a simple pipe. It can be a habitat for you know, turtles to lay eggs and for migrating herring. It can be a place of recreation. Um, and it can be a place of health. So thank you. water actually get out of the Muddy River and into the Charles it's through a system of culverts, I believe? Yeah. And does yeah. it have to be that way, or can there be a natural uh, shape? No. It's a very good question. Um, we'll show you right here. Um, we have a drawing of where that happens. Um, so you're right, there's a series of four culverts that go from that fence pond bridge under to the Charles right here. Um, if you actually stand on the bridge and, and look over this edge here, you can see the water below going through. And ultimately, that would, in an ideal world, that would be a really wonderful thing to open that back up again. Um, something that's really detrimental to the health of the water is to be culverted. Um, so bringing that open to daylight would be a, an amazing thing. So there's five pipes. <laughs> um, I think it's in white on this rendering here. There's a a sort of an orphan little 19th century red brick piece of industrial building. What is it? This what's right here. It? Yeah, what's, it all, what's the story? Yeah, that, so that's the, uh, it's a gatehouse um, that manages, I believe, um, the Stony Brook conduit runs under Charles Gate East through here. And then there's the, the Metropolitan conduit that runs along here. 
The, sto the gatehouse. Mar Mar is it the marginal kind of? Sorry, sorry those drink drinking water supply or well off? No, it's um, storm sewer. And um, it's storm sewer, so that can out that manages whether it, gets out it outfalls here at the Charles River or goes into the marginal conduit so it, along it, here. It really harkens back to it again, I think was often described as like the genius of Olmsted. This was all, again, this is a case where this was all we could call it the Atlantic Ocean. You know, it was tidal. It was an inlet off the ocean. So it's even sort of a strange misnomer that we call it a river today. It was a, it was a marsh inlet, um, salt marsh, which is often why I think people are distracted or confused, like, oh, why is it so stagnant? It's so flat. Well, it's fundamentally a marsh that we've now shaped to look like a river. And I think that's, it's very important to remember that is that I think it's a really fantastic realization to say this is not like a river it didn't exist 300 years ago we built it and so the question is when you build a river like well what kind of river do you want <laughs> and so it's like we made it and so how do we want it to perform and who do we want the river to be for and in, a, in an interesting way it's about taking responsibility for that sometimes we always wonder if the, the, the weird belief that this is somehow some natural thing and it just existed here and it is the way it is because that's the way it is almost you know leads people to shrug their shoulders and it just is what it is it's a design piece of architecture shaped every every contour of it was drawn by someone and made that way every drop of water that comes into it comes into it because we put it there um, so the habitat of it the ecosystems of it the quality of the water is like up to us uh, so I think that's what's exciting is about redesigning it when Olmsted was sort of worked on this, he, there's two rivers, and one's the Muddy River and one's the Stony Brook. Um, one's a pipe, uh, literally a pipe, that's the Stony Brook, uh, and one is a day-lit um, water evacuation system, which is the Muddy, the muddy River. And that gatehouse is essentially what uh, pumps the, the Stony Brook immediately parallel to the river, which was a whole construct. Um, and it diverts it to the marginal conduit, um, which then sends it to Deer Island for sewage treatment. Uh, two questions. One, given the very shallow gradient you've described in the area, uh, how would that? How can you manage to avoid the algae blooms that you saw or we've seen? Um, and the second question is, did, uh, in the um, broader plans of the city. Uh, in the anticipation of the generally higher water levels, is, have you contemplated using this as a, um, a flood catchment area and flood management uh, resource? Well, sure. So, I mean, first, the issue of the duckweed is a really interesting one, because on, on one hand, the duckweed is kind of like unattractive in its current context. On the other hand, it, it's sort of a strange cure of sorts. So duckweed occurs when you have an overabundance of nutrients and the duckweed actually sort of absorbs those nutrients. Um, uh, that's how it grows, right? So in an interesting way, it's actually helping to kind of neutralize the chemical content of the water. Um, ideally, what we would be doing in that case is actually harvesting the duckweed when it blooms because you remove all those nutrients. To help reduce that, some of this is where we've learned a lot of this from our river restoration ecology firm, is um, Things like the really steep armored embankment makes it that look quite literally, it's like nasty or something. When the, you know, all the geese, for example, all the poop from the geese is directly flushed into the river. So it's a direct nutrient source, which gets all these kind of coli breakouts and nutrient sources. Anything that happens on land right now is directly flushed. So the question becomes that's part of why, by actually um, lowering the slope of those embankments and slowing that rapid influx of nutrients, it will actually um, reduce that influx that causes the duckweed blooms. Now the truth of the matter is, is that can be handled here, but again, every drop of water in Brookline and the back bay ends up here. So and on one hand, you have to make those improvements here, but these are also improvements that have to be made throughout the city. Right, everywhere there's a catch basin, there could be a different approach to water management. So it's it's sort of a systematic approach, but there are definitely immediate things that can be done here. Clearly, the Boker overpass above is a huge source of nitrogen and phosphorus. So just taking that water, and to your point, by essentially taking that rainwater, yeah, uh, for it, uh, 
mitigates the impact of, let's say, uh, rising waters. Um, in many ways, surge events occur often when you have like rain or storm. So you have two sources of water. You have the influx from the ocean, and you have all the rain water coming from above. So by essentially reducing the grade by allowing flooding in the areas, you are creating kind of catchment for water. That was actually Olmsted's, again, original idea. Um, that's why things like the fins are designed to, were originally designed to be floodable, um, as was this. This was actually this back in the 1880s, held more water. water. Um, it was a water catchment for the city. When we built the highway, we constricted it and then tried to flush it out, which fundamentally all that means is it has less carrying capacity than it did in the 80s, so, or 1880s. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is actually expand that floodable zone. I know that when uh, T-Stop sometimes is flooded, will this rectify that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it might help. <laughs> I think that a lot of the, the Muddy River restoration work is, is at least hoping to mitigate that flooding. It's, a, it's an amazing hydrologic system when you think about it, because in the end of the day, again, this used to be a salt water marsh. It was tidal. It had a 12-foot tide change. So that's where the water you know, used to come from. Then we dammed the Charles River. And so the challenge is all becoming a major rain event that happens to be on a moon tide. You know, The ocean happens to be high. There's nowhere for the water in the Charles River to go because the ocean's so high. Well, that water in the Charles River is going to back right up into the Muddy River. Um, so it's all connected. And then all you're doing at that point is hope, you know, you're waiting six hours for low tide. <laughs> so then literally you can flush the city out. Um, which is why building a little bit more carrying capacity in the ground uh, is helpful. But I mean, we're competing at the scale, like in terms of water management, you are competing at the scale of the ocean. You know, you're competing at the scale of a moon tide. <laughs> so when you're talking about the Muddy River, I wonder if you could explain whether there's been um, some of your plans have benefited from the daylighting of the Muddy River. Uh, uh, that took place and whether that's a model that that might be recreated elsewhere on the river or in other places? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think the introduction of vegetation and daylighting is, is helpful toward water quality. Charles, the Charles Gate area gets everything from upstream. So any improvement upstream is going to have great benefit for us at Charles Gate. So we, you know, the Muddy River Restoration Projects, I think there have been measurable water quality um, improvements at Charles Gate from some studies that we've heard about. Um, and there's lessons to be learned in terms of just trying to renaturalize the shoreline and all of the improvements that can come from that. But without a doubt, I mean, daylighting a, like the, the like water, we don't think about it this way, it's like a living thing, you know, and it depends on air, you know, it depends on sunlight because, you know, water is inseparable from the plants and inseparable from the species that live in it. It's all one, like, living system. And you put that in a pipe and you deprive the water of oxygen and you deprive it of light and it dies and it literally becomes just dead water, right? And so I think the daylighting project of the Mike River up by the Landmark Center is an uh, unbelievable like, gift to the system, the hydrologic system of Boston. It would be one of our greatest ambitions to work with different agencies to figure out how to daylight this last bit. It's quite literally, we've been meeting with the Marine Science Department at Northeastern to try and figure out like the habitat runs that are being deprived currently because the entire health of that river is being compromised compromise now and again I call it even a river it's it, we built that you know so at some point we decided we're going to build it this way and we don't care that there's no herring run. like we're because right. it just wasn't a parameter of the design so the question is if you do care about that how do you redesign the river to actually make that possible to make it like a living organism again can I ask one more? can you talk a little bit about your intergovernmental about your relationships with these multiple government agencies <laughs> and how, you know, you overcome any difficulties. Yeah, so... Oh. No, I, I was going to... DCR and DOT have been getting uh, in the same room a lot for this project. Um, it started in, I think, uh, actually one year ago, we had our first meeting with both agencies together. Um, they understand pretty well that there's, there's a moment of connection at Charles Gate. 
Um, we work regularly with uh, Patrice Kish at DCR to talk about these plans, and so they've been coordinating on every stage of the project. And then um, a lot of a lot of the kind of connectivity issues, the water quality issues, of course, really are heavily impacted by what um, DOT wants to do in the area. We have some more projects on the books for the future that deal with some of the, the north and south boundaries of, of Charles Gate, which um, could have some exciting opportunities for this in the future. One, I think we have one more, and then we have a reception where we can continue to talk to our, our guests. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to think about being able to walk in, in that park. It's always intrigued me, and, and this is really very exciting. What I don't see, and, and I'm hoping you can tell me is, is actually there somewhere, is the connection between the, the Muddy River Parkway and the Esplanade. Is there a pedestrian link, or is that something that is just beyond the, the scope of this conversation? Well, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I'm going to say this project is at an incredibly critical moment, right? Like that, a community. I mean, you know, this is, uh, to be honest, a uh, one of a kind or a first of its kind for us. I mean, we've done pretty significant infrastructural landscape projects that were privately funded by corporations who happen to have a, you know, Portland or something like that. And then we've done projects where the DOT or, uh, you know, is that's like the N93 project, right? We want to improve This is the first time we've confronted a situation like this where a community group from nothing, like from zero, managed to get enough like energy and momentum and volunteer their time at you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours to generate the attention at this scale. This isn't like creating a, you know, a pocket park you know, in the neighborhood. This is about trying to contend with regional scale, federal infrastructure and make change. Right, and that's what's I think so kind of impressive about the undertaking so far is that you know now a group Charles Gate Alliance has 200 people. They've got all these partnerships. They have the ear of the DOT and the DCR to create the momentum and instigation of this. The that actual connection we're showing there is most definitely possible to connect the Emerald Necklace to the Esplanade. It's something that we're in active conversations with. Um, the DOT about. It's a real challenge infrastructurally with that has significant capital concerns. Uh, embedded in this, there is already plans of tying the site up to the Mass Ave Bridge. That's huge. But we agree that the, like, the real like achievement is getting that connection back and recognizing that that's a, at a great cost and will be significant, but will is of unbelievable benefit, right? because you have a park system that goes from Watertown all the way to the entire Harbor Walk of Boston, right? It ties to the entire Emerald Necklace to Roxbury and it terminates the whole thing at the Boston Public Garden and through the Comab Mall. And it all gets broken at that <laughs> nucleus right there. And so, yeah, it might be a little tricky, not that hard actually, to reroute some of the roads to make that possible, but the reward to do that is, um, you know, uh, a once in a lifetime change in the history of the city. So that's what we're trying to achieve. That was incredibly exciting, daunting, and uh, inspiring. So thank you so much, Dan and Marie, for that. Um, a little token of our appreciation, we're going to give you a, well, our book of the, of the public garden. Olmsted came to Boston and said Boston has a common and a garden and a mall and now it needs a park, which is what his 1,100-acre park was. So thank you so much. It's really wonderful. So we all welcome, we welcome you to our reception where we can have some food and drink and more conversation. Thank you.